Welcome everyone to the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School event. Um, to advocate for farmed animals with an advanced degree in animal law. Next slide, please. And our mission here at the Center for Animal Law Studies is to educate the next generation of animal law advocates and to advance animal protection through the law. And next slide, please. And so this is just a presentation overview. Um, so after this welcome, um, I'll be uh, turning the floor over to Joyce Tischler, um, who'll be discussing farm animal advocacy and how um, an LLM or MSL degree can advance animal advocacy in the farm to animal context. Um, after that, um, Megan Senatori will be talking about some of the work that our alumni in action are doing. And following that, we'll have um, a few minutes set aside for um, Q&A. Next slide, please. So um, just in terms of introducing ourselves, uh, my name is Raj Reddy. I'm the director of the Animal Law Program. Um, I also got my JD here at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School, and I teach international animal law and animal legal philosophy, among other courses. Um, Megan. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us today. My name is Megan Senatori, and I'm the Associate Director at the Center for Animal Law Studies. And should you join us in the program, I will be your professor in the Companion Animal Law course, as well as Emerging Topics. And with that, I will turn it over to our wonderful Joyce Tischler. Hello everyone, I'm Joyce Tischler. In 1979, I co-founded and built the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and now I'm proud to be a professor of practice in animal law. Animals who are raised for food desperately need our help. In the US alone, we are killing 10 billion farmed animals every year, 80 billion on an international level, and that number is increasing. We need to train lawyers to challenge this abusive food production system. That's my goal. And that's why I teach industrial animal agriculture law, both in person and online at the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School. In my industrial animal agriculture law course, students will take a deep dive into the world of industrialized animal agriculture, otherwise known as concentrated animal feeding operations concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFO. And you'll hear me use that ac acronym throughout. These students will learn about the current way in which farmed animals are raised, transported and slaughtered and how we can challenge that system through the law and create a better life for farmed animals. We begin the course with a review of the conditions in which farmed animals are raised in the CAFO system. In this unnatural and cruel food production system, farmed animals suffer due to intensive confinement. They are raised inside massive buildings and crowded together. They never feel the rays of the sun. They don't have the opportunity to express themselves as they naturally would by roaming in a pasture, eating grass, scratching for bugs, and socializing with other animals. Instead, they are crowded together with nothing to do. They can't move freely. They have no privacy and they can't get away from more aggressive animals. They also suffer from mutilations such as debeaking, which is severing the tip of a chicken's beak, dehorning cattle, castration of the male pigs and cattle, tail docking or cutting off the tails of cows, severing the parts of toes of turkeys, all done without anesthesia or painkillers, and all of which are performed by the meat, dairy, and egg industries in order to cope with the problems that those industries created by forcing animals into intensive confinement. These animals suffer due to Frankenstein breeding practices um, invented by the CAFO industry and intended to maximize production and output from the animals, such as turkeys, who have been bred to grow massive breasts, chickens who have been manipulated to grow so quickly that they are sent to slaughter in seven weeks, 
dairy cows who were bred to have giant sized udders and produce massive amounts of milk. All of these are harmful to the animals themselves. And these animals are being treated as if they were unthinking, unfeeling machines. The animals suffer due to a lack of individualized veterinary care, deformities, broken bones and illnesses go untreated. And there are cruel practices such as forced malting where egg laying hens are deprived of food and water for two weeks in order to force them to produce more eggs. So I'm going to give you a bird's eye view of what is included in the Industrial Animal Agriculture Law course. We start the course off with a description of the terrible conditions that I've just given you a, a tiny perspective on, in which billions of intelligent and sentient beings are raised and the suffering that they endure for the 99% of the time they are alive and trapped inside the CAFO building. It's important that my students comprehend the underpinnings of the CAFO system about how the current system of raising farmed animals for food developed in the mid 20th century and what policies and forces allow this system to remain the dominant form of animal agriculture in the US and now in the world. And then I ask the students to review the European Union laws that govern the treatment of farmed animals while they are being raised in those countries. And we compare those laws to the total absence of federal law in the US that would set even minimum standards for the animals raised in the CAFO system. And that's for the 99% of the time they're being raised. Students are often surprised to find that the laws of the EU are at least two decades ahead of the American laws. Then we review the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill is a national bill that comes out about every five years and it sets nationwide policies that subsidize and support this horrible industrial agriculture system at the expense of the animals and family farms. And we address how farmed animals are treated during transport. While it's only a, per, a small percentage of their time, they are crowded into trucks with no food or water. They may be there for hours, sometimes for days, and injury or death occur all too frequently. We compare the EU laws governing transport to the American laws that govern transport, and we discuss what could be improved in both systems so that the animals are better protected. We then focus on the difficult and disturbing issue of slaughter. The students come away with an understanding that the current laws do not adequately protect farmed animals as they undergo slaughter. And we review what animal advocates are doing to challenge this problem in the courts. Please advance the slide. At this point, we shift gears and review other harms that CAFOs cause and how advocates have challenged those harms. Slide, please. The CAFO food production system causes an enormous amount of animal suffering. And I intentionally teach this course, however, with a holistic approach. I want my students to understand all of the harms the CAFO industry creates and be able to challenge this massive industry legally from all of the angles that you see on this slide. The CAFO industry not only harms animals, it pollutes the environment. It harms the people who live near these facilities as well as the people who work in these facilities. It harms consumers. It has destroyed the family farming communities throughout America and it sometimes damages food safety and public health. Broad base of harms that you see on this slide provides us with an opportunity to approach the system and the problem from a variety of perspectives, as well as to partner with colleagues from other movements and build a bigger tent for advocacy for these animals. I present my students with a visual of the CAFO system as if it were a circle. And surrounding that circle are each of the harms caused by this monopolistic and destructive meat, dairy, and egg industry. This is the challenge we face but this is also the opportunity. By identifying each of these harms, I teach my students how to attack the problem from every angle, poking holes wherever possible. 
for example, some people may not care very much about the protection of the animals, but they may take action when it's their air and their water that's becoming polluted. So my students learn about the negative impacts of CAFOs on the environment, air pollution, water pollution, degradation of soil, violations of environmental laws. We also discuss the significant negative impacts that CAFOs have on climate change. My students also review lawsuits in which those impacts have been effectively challenged. I ask my students to consider how CAFOs and slaughterhouses negatively impact the people who work in them and the communities that are forced to live next to them because CAFO com CAFOs come into already existing communities, often of people who are low income and people of color. This is called environmental justice and we review some of the recent lawsuits that have challenged these injustices and explain how these human populations are fighting back. Infos also threaten human health and food safety through the overuse of antibiotics and the rise of E. coli and salmonella. salmonella. And that's another way to change the CAFO system. And then we look at the tactics that farmed animals and uh, farmed animal and other advocates have used to counter the CAFO system and increase protections for farmed animals and protect the environment and protect the people impacted by the CAFO system. For example, legal advocates have used false and misleading advertising, labeling, and consumer protection laws as an indirect means to challenge the current substandard treatment of farmed animals. We also touch on an emerging topic, the use of antitrust laws to challenge the monopolies that control the meat, dairy, and egg industries today. And another important topic we cover is the introduction of innovative tactics at the state level in the United States. Since 1999, animal advocates have used state ballot, ballot initiatives, which bypass the state legislatures and allow voters to directly pass laws in their state. Bringing the abuse of farmed animals directly to the voters and consumers has been a game changer because they care. They care about protecting these animals. And it has also caused some legislatures to join in and pass more protective laws. My students also consider the role of undercover investigations at CAFOs and slaughterhouses. When these CAFOs and slaughterhouses operate in the dark, they win. However, when activists shed a light on what is happening in these places, it can create public awareness and a demand by consumers for better conditions. But we have to understand that the industry is not meekly accepting our efforts to increase protections for farmed animals. In fact, just the opposite. They have already worked with legislators who support them and they have enacted strong barriers intended to silence animal advocates. We look at the impacts of such laws, ag gag laws, the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, right to farm legislation, and food disparagement laws. These laws have been developed specifically to threaten and intimidate animal advocates and stop our progress. And while CAFOs may have started in the US, they now exist in every developed country and they're moving into developing countries. So we look at how the CAFO industry in other countries is producing meat dairy, and eggs. And we compare that to the treatment of those farmed animals in the US and what's happening in the US and Europe. At the end of the semester, we consider the future of food production. Coming from different perspectives, we look at them all. In what direction or directions should our food production system go? Should we rely more on bigger CAFOs? Should we look to regenerative or sustainable agriculture, plant-based meat, cell-cultivated meat, alternatives to cow's milk, such as almond milk, cashew milk, hemp milk, soy, alternatives to eggs? The students have an opportunity to express what they think is the preferred option and why. When students have completed this course, they will understand how the CAFO system works and how to effectively challenge it. 
if they wish to pursue a career in farmed animal protection or farmed animal law, they have many of the tools they will need to make them an attractive candidate to be hired by animal protection organizations. If they already have a farmed animal career, this course will enhance their knowledge and their skills exponentially. If this is the training you've been looking for, I hope you will apply to enter our program and join us at Lewis. <laughs> Thank you. And now back to Megan. Thank you, Professor Tischler, for that very comprehensive overview of the Industrial Animal Agriculture Law Course. Um, what I would like to do now is transition to just give you examples of a few of our alumni who have done work in the field. This is not to the exclusion of other alumni of ours who are also doing this work, but to highlight some from around the world and the type of work that they're doing. We are proud to have over 50 alumni from our LLM program from over 20 countries, and that number is growing all the time. And we launched an MSL program for non-lawyers um, this fall. Our first class has joined us, and we are excited about the contributions that they will make to the field as well. So with that, if we could go to the first slide. Oops, I think we may have lost the slideshow, at least on my side. I'll go ahead and get started. I'm not seeing the slideshow on my slide, but I'd first uh, like to feature Bianca Atlas, who is a 2020 graduate of our LLM program from New Zealand. And some of her contributions to the field of farmed animal protection was to help lead a campaign with an organization called SAFE, Save Animals from Exploitation, in New Zealand to end live export. New Zealand, uh, prior to this ban, which take us, takes effect next year, was exporting 135,000 animals uh, by sea. And it's a brutal journey, as you can imagine. Bianca helped to end that. She's also been a presenter addressing the controversies surrounding the labeling of plant-based meat products and contributing to that area of the field as well. If you could advance the slide. Alice DiConcetto is the next alum who we'd like to feature. She's a 2016 graduate from France. And Professor Tischler talked um, about the important advancements in farmed animal law in the European Union. Alice has founded a organization called the European Institute for Animal Law and Policy. She has become an expert on animal advocacy and farmed animal welfare in the EU. And working with the Collar Foundation, she helped to create a database of laws and policies that impact farmed animals around the world so that there is a tool now um, for compiling all of those laws for people who work in this space. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the next slide, please, which is Yvonne Guerrera. Uh, Yvonne is a recent graduate. Graduate. She graduated just this past spring or summer. Um, she received our Outstanding Animal Law LLM Award. And she, like so many of our alums, founded a nonprofit organization while she was a student with us. Her nonprofit is called uh, Animal Advocates International. And among the work that her nonprofit is doing is a campaign raising awareness about reducing the use of battery cages for hens in Zimbabwe. Um, we, for those of you who may follow us on social media or on our website, Yvonne wrote a wonderful blog about her work that we featured yesterday, so you can find that there. And for the next slide, please. Claire Howe is a 2014 alum of our program, and she also founded a nonprofit organization, and she serves as its executive director. Her nonprofit is called Ravencore, and they have an innovative mission where they work on youth-centered um, activism to dismantle, dismantle systems of oppression for all animals and for the natural world. Claire was also a featured panelist this past weekend, I guess it was the weekend before, at our annual animal law conference that CALS co-hosts annually with the Animal Legal Defense Fund. So Claire talked about her work at that recent conference as well. If I could have the next slide. Diego Plaza is a 2020 graduate from Chile, and he also founded not one but two nonprofits, the Center for Chilean Animal Law Studies and the Interspecies Justice Foundation. Among his important contributions to the field include presenting and advocating regarding um, wild and aquatic farmed animals. 
We um, didn't touch on it too much in today's presentation, but we'll, we'll talk about it with two more of our alums in a moment. We slaughter so many aquatic farmed animals that they are not even kept track of as individuals, but rather by weight and tons. And so Diego is one of our alums who is working in that space. And if we could advance the slide. Lu Shigay is a 2020 alum from Kazakhstan. She, along with the next alum who I'll feature in a moment, co-founded the Institute of Animal Law Asia, and Lou serves as its managing director. They, um, I should note, several of these alums also applied to and were awarded um, grants as part of our Global Ambassador Program. And so among the work that, they, that Lou did as a Global Ambassador was to create webinars, academic and educational awareness materials about aquatic animals and aquaculture. And along with Lou, if we could have the next slide, is Zi Hao Yu, who is a 2020 alum from China. He co-founded Institute of Animal Law of Asia with Lou, and, and he serves as its executive director. And as his uh, project, as one of our global ambassadors, he created academic and educational materials to raise awareness about farmed animals in mainland China. As Professor Tischler was talking about, we have laws here in the United States for farmed animals. They're certainly not good enough and they can certainly be improved. Many of our alums are going out and back to their home countries where there are no laws currently in place to address some of these issues. So they're doing really innovative work to raise awareness and also to eventually have laws in this space in their home countries. Um, and if I could have the next slide. Um, finally, before we move to our q and I just wanted to encourage you to stay connected with us. We are very active on social media. We are on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook. We post a lot of updates about the work of our alumni, as well as our webinars, conferences, and events. And you can also sign up for our quarterly newsletter where we also feature our work. So with that, I would like to invite Professor Tischler and Dr. Reddy back um, on, and we are gonna do a Q&A. And I invite you to submit questions to the Q&A feature on Zoom. You are welcome to submit questions about the, um, about the MSL or LLM program, about our online program, substantive, substantive questions you may have about Professor Tischler's presentation. Um, and with that, I will see what we have in here. Um, I'm gonna um, summarize this question a little bit um, and thank you for the person who contributed, who is a Brazilian lawyer. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's for you, Professor Tischler. Um, the questioner agrees that CAFOs are a huge problem around the world. And the question is essentially given the size and the um, resources of agribusiness, what, how do we implement an efficient approach against agribusiness lobbying in legal education? Um, the, the person gives the example of in their state, there's no LLM in animal law, um, but there are more than five LLMs in agribusiness law. Ooh. So with that, I'll invite we you. We change that, don't we? Yes, um, exactly. <laughs> it, that's exactly why we have introduced the online LLM program at Lewis and Clark. Um, if you can come to Portland and spend a year and take our LLM program, that's wonderful. We would love to see you. If you can't, if you can't give up your job and you need to be with your family, then you can take the two-year LLM program online and you will learn all of the things that I talked about, uh, as well as the variety of other classes that we offer, companion animal law, the, the fundamentals of animal law, and all of those other classes. So um, what we're hoping, and what, what I'll tell you what I hope, and, and you'll see it, and, and you saw it with our alumni in action. I hope that people come study with us and then go back to their country of origin and start just as I did 40 some odd years ago. You start with nothing and you build it. That's, that, that's my hope. We wanna see animal law taught and practiced all over the world. Thank you, Professor Tischler, that's wonderful. Dr. Rennie, do you have anything that you wanted to add in general to the topic about the animal, about the LLM program or people returning to their home countries and the work they do there? Sure, um, and I think this is a great question. And one of the things that I often recommend to our graduates is to, you know, now that, they, now that I know there are five LLMs in agribusiness law, to what extent can you sort of tap into 
um, those opportunities to teach those classes. I mean, it's one thing to teach animal law um, in its own sort of discipline, um, animal law being sort of this, this area of the law where the interests of animals are centered. Um, and that's that's sort of the, the, the lens to which we um, interrogate these issues. But if you could teach a course in um, an agribusiness law course and, you know, introduce, you know, these, these, these notions that, you know, consumers care about the humane treatment of animals. And to the extent that, you know, certain businesses are hiding that, um, hiding that cruelty from the public, the consuming public in particular, that that's, that's bad for their bottom line. And you get to engage with, um, with audiences who, you know, want to hear what you have to say, and it somewhat aligns with sort of their view. And so you're also sort of planting seeds in them as to, you know, oh, I didn't really think about how this particular practice is also engaged or is inherently cruel. It was just sort of normalized for me. And so you have an opportunity to take what you learn um, here at the Center for Animal Law Studies and reach, again, sort of new and, um, uh, and sort of audiences who are going to be really well positioned to you know, bring these, these unique perspectives into the industry. I'd like to add that um, there currently is no casebook to teach industrial animal agriculture law, whatever you want to call it, CAFO law, industrial animal ag law. Um, so I'm working with three other people to write one. We're drafting it right now. It'll come out in English sometime in the next couple of years, I hope. Um, but that needs to happen. And, and that that kind of course with that kind of casebook could be taught in the environmental law sphere. It could be used in the agribusiness law sphere. Uh, it could be used in the health and public safety, uh, food safety sphere. So we need the courses taught, but we need people to, to do them. And you are in the belly of the beast in, in Brazil. Uh, so yeah, we would love to look to you to, to help us with, with spreading the word. Thank you both for those answers. Those are great. And um, Professor Tischler, I'm very glad that you mentioned your industrial animal agriculture law textbook, because I do think that'll be instrumental in taking what we're doing here at the Center for Animal Law Studies and helping to expand courses like that. Um, so uh, I wanted to uh, take another question, and this one is directed um, to Dr. Reddy, but Professor Tischler, you're welcome to contribute to it as well. And the person is asking, what is the bridge between the MSL program and the LLM program? So could you describe how the two of those interface and, and um, the bridge between them? Sure, and this is a really great question. So the MSL program is really designed for non-lawyers, and so for um, any sort of change that you want to affect for animals or a significant um, sort of area of change that you could uh, affect for animals. It, you know, those, the way that we treat animals, the way we're allowed to treat animals is codified through the law. And so the, the question that we, um, that we asked when we were developing the MSL program is, do you necessarily need a law degree to engage in some of this work? Or do you need sort of this substantive knowledge of the law? And so the MSL program is really geared to give you that substantive knowledge of the law so that you can engage in uh, legislative drafting, lobbying, um, better, um, more informed advocacy, to work with veterinarians, to work with you know, uh, people who are in positions to really affect change, but that you don't necessarily need to go and get additional education to, um, to sort of effectuate. And so that's the, that's the MSL program. It doesn't, again, require as a prerequisite either an LLB if you're an international candidate or a JD if you're a US candidate. The LLM is really designed for folks who have that LLB or that JD, but they didn't necessarily have an opportunity to um, engage in animal law issues um, at their home institution or their have been working for several years and they want to transition into uh, a new career in, in animal advocacy. And so they, they already have the legal tools. It's how do I get that substantive knowledge to put my sort of legal tools and my ability to practice the law um, into, um, uh, into effect for, for animals. And that's the sort of the distinction between the MSL and the LLM program. And if you're um, in the online program, you're more or less taking sort of the same slate of courses. So the programs are very similar in that way. If you're in the in-person program, 
um, you have some additional opportunities to, um, if you're an LLM candidate, to engage in sort of our clinical opportunities. So um, we have a global uh, wild animal clinic, uh, farmed animal protection project, um, which is also actually um, open to MSL candidates as well. But um, you do have the opportunity to work with clients um, if you're in the in-person program. But again, you'll gain a lot of the same substantive sort of mastery of these areas, whether you're in the online or the in-person. Thank hey, you, that was very comprehensive. Yes, I was gonna to turn to you, Professor Tischler, to add to it. Actually, I was wondering, could you describe the, the International Wildlife Program and the, the farmed animal um, lobbying legislation, is it Russ Mead's program? Because I think those are really exciting opportunities for people to do things that you often don't get to do in law school. Sure. And do you want me to do that or do you want to do that, Dr. Sure, Ray? please. Yeah. And what do you want to add to some of it? Um, the Farmed Animal Protection Project is headed up by Professor Russ Mead, and it's a unique opportunity for students, including non-lawyers, which is what's really cool about it. It's part, it's available for MSL students to do farmed animal protection projects. So the students come up with individual projects that they wanna focus on, that they then work on through this experiential learning opportunity um, with the other students. And they're doing really innovative um, type work, raising awareness um, about farmed animal protection in different countries. There are several students, um, given our track rec record of starting successful nonprofits, there are several students who are focusing on that space. There are students fo focusing on transitioning um, pursuing laws that transition um, animal agriculture to non-animal agriculture. So a lot of really neat opportunities that give students a lot of flexibility to come up with projects that they can use to improve the lives of farmed animals. So that's one of them. Um, the other is our International Wildlife Law Clinic, and that is an opportunity for our LLM students. So one does have to be a have to be an LLM student for that opportunity. Um, but under the supervision of, clini of clinical professor Erica Lyman, um, who teaches our Global Wild Animal Law course, the students work on international law issues to improve the lives of wild animals in the spaces that they live in. So they do projects working with our Global Law Alliance for Animals in the Environment. And I know it's a lot of, a lot of acronyms and a lot of words there, but what is cool about that is it is an innovative collaboration between CALS and our environmental law program, given the immense intersectional issues between environmental law and animal law. We are working together with them and um, it gives students an opportunity to work in that space. So that's kind of a, um, Big picture overview, but I don't know if Dr. Reddy or um, Professor Tischel, you have anything you want to add that I didn't include. I just love those programs. I think they're so yeah, innovative they're really and, and I think the students really gain a lot from yeah. them. Yeah, and um, yeah. you know, for the International Wildlife Clinic, um, Professor Lyman is over at you know the convention of the parties in Panama City right now. So they're doing they're doing this this work and um, really making a difference. So sorry, yeah. I think I accidentally cut you off, Raj. I don't know. I think um, you captured it really well. And um, again, those are both in-person opportunities, and both of those courses are a year long. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to. Two questions that I'm going to combine into one, and Dr. Reddy, you, you touched on a bit of it in um, your earlier response, but one of the questions asks, is the program appropriate for lawyers who have been in practice for many years, or is the focus on newer lawyers or lawyers from other parts of the world? And the corresponding question that is similar is, do you see value in this degree for Americans who have already had a lengthy, lengthy career in animal welfare advocacy, such as in drafting or lobbying, but they would like to branch out to other areas such as litigation and teaching? So I thought we could combine those two questions into one. Sure, so tackling the first one, whether the degree and the program is appropriate for um, lawyers who've been practicing for many years. We actually have quite a few um, pro uh, students in the online program, but also um, in the in-person program who have been practicing for many years and they might be doing you know, insurance law or tort law. Um, they might be doing something in the, the business law realm, but they really want to either pivot or sort of complement sort of the work that they're doing. And so folks who have been you know, um, attorneys for 15, 20, 30 years, 
And, you know, sometimes these folks are in, you know, very deep conversations with their, their firm partners about adding sort of a new wing, a new area of practice to um, their particular firm. And I think as Professor Tischler mentioned, you know, if you're, if you work on consumer protection issues, um, but you're really interested in farm to animal advocacy, well, here's sort of a new pathway for you to improve the lives of animals and really do sort of the ethical work that, that moves you. And so absolutely, um, we have both, um, you know, new um, sort of novice lawyers. So folks who've just gotten their JD or their LLB who come to the program, but we also have quite a few um, candidates who um, come to the program after having practiced again, 15, 20 years. And I'll say for those folks, um, it's often harder to move, you know, to relocate to Portland, Oregon. Um, and so the online program has been a really like a boon for them um, to, to empower them to sort of, again, sort of incorporate animal advocacy into, into their practice. Um, and then as to the, the second question, um, so does this, um, does this, what's the value of this degree for those candidates who might be engaged already or have been engaged for many years in legislative drafting, lobbying, um, but want to, you know, branch out and do some litigation and teaching. And, you know, it's particularly if you want to do teaching, um, having a substantive knowledge of different sort of areas of the law and the nuances. And you probably have a, uh, a pretty sound understanding of how, um, what laws um, are likely to be passed, what laws, you know, have a chance. But um, I think as Professor Tischler mentioned, you know, there are a number of other opportunities like um, ballot initiatives. So, you know, what's happening right now in California, what's happened in Massachusetts and these other sort of areas or pathways to um, effectuating the interests of, of animals. But, um, you'll also cover a number of really important and really timely animal law cases. And so if you really want to have a substantive knowledge of, you know, these are the legal arguments that have worked for animals, then you will be covering those, those cases in companion animal law, international animal law, farmed animal law, aquatic animal law, and the like. And so, yeah, the program is appropriate for, for those folks as well. And to the question about teaching, um, whether you're in the in-person or the online, um, you know, you're, you're be able to emulate the teachers who are teaching animal law. And um, something that, you know, Professor Senatori didn't, didn't mention, is that a number of our advocates have gone out and are now teaching animal law in their home countries and in other states. You know, just this past year, we had a graduate um, who is now teaching animal law, which has somewhat been on the books for some time, but it hasn't been taught in a long time at Indiana University. And so uh, really a credit to the animal law program and the courses that she was able to take here. Great, thank you so much. I um, want to get to a couple of um, questions in different areas, and these pertain, this first one pertains to the online program. One of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us from Romania today, um, and she's interested in starting the program, but wants to know, is there any, is it necessary at all to travel to the United States to start with the program, even if you're just studying in the online program? Is there any component of it that would require someone to come to the United States? No. No, you, you no. can take the program fully online. And, and yeah. we'll add, oh, we're probably gonna say the same thing. We're probably thing, gonna say the same thing. So you go for it and then I'll add if I have anything. Okay. Um, and the program's also 100% asynchronous. And so what that means is that you don't have to be up at a certain time to you know engage with the course content. So everything is scheduled via modules that open and close you know one week after after the next. And you engage with the course content. You engage with your professor. You engage with your peers, and you have such a substantive. Um, you have a mastery of the substantive material by the by the end of the course. And um, you know, there's been a lot of questions about you know, online teaching and online learning. And we've been, you know, exceptionally thrilled um, by the quality of the students that were, um, that were gonna be graduating, you know, for the first time, this is our first cohort that will be graduating this, um, this fall. Um, yeah, it's, it's just been nothing short of, of amazing. And, um, you know, in part because of, 
the the quality of the content, but also because of the passion that the students bring to this particular program. Yeah. And one of the things that's impressed me about the students who have come in the online MSL program is, is their backgrounds. We have a physicist, we have veterinarians, we have lobbyists, and we can add to that. There are people from a variety of backgrounds who um, we wouldn't have expected to, to, to take this course, and yet they're interested in it and they will, they will further their own careers um, with the knowledge that they get from, from this program. Yeah, and I'll just add really quickly to that. That's so true. And we also have folks who are coming to the MSL program because they want to retire into doing animal protection work. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the most heartening things and uh, about teaching in this program is really seeing what folks who are, you know, retiring into this work um, and are driven again, just by the passion that they have for animal advocacy and animal protection. Um, in whatever sort of particular area of um, animal protection sort of speaks to them, but it's it's yeah, it's just been nothing short of of amazing. Yeah, yeah, those are both great. And to loop it back to an earlier question, the diversity of experience and geographic background, and whether they're lawyers or non-lawyers or experienced lawyers, newer lawyers, lawyers who've done animal law but maybe not in all of the different areas. The learning environment is really rich because all of the students are contributing all of that to the classroom and it's just a wonderful thing to experience as a, as a teacher. Um, I want to go to another question, um, which is about um, financial resources. Are there any financial resources available to cover some of the costs of the LLM program other than taking the program by taking out student loans? And it, I just wanted to clarify in the question covering both in-person study and online study. So you want to take that one? Yes, Dr. we Martin? have. Um, yes. Thank you. We have um, financial support for both of those categories. And so just taking a step back, the um, the deadline for the in-person program is February 1st, whether that's um, LLM or MSL. And the deadline for the online program is May 15th, again, whether that's LLM or MSL. And as long as you apply by that particular deadline, um, you'll be considered for scholarship support. And um, the vast majority of our candidates um, that we accept are offered um, a scholarship. Um, and that's, again, for both the in-person and, and the online. And you'll be notified of what that particular um, support is, um, if we're able to offer it, to help you make the best decision for you. And um, you know, considering your, your financial position. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna take two of the questions, uh, two more and sort of put them together. Are there opportunities to make professional connections through the online program? And a corresponding question is, what are the job opportunities like in the field if you're not starting your own nonprofit organization? So what, because I did feature a lot of those, uh, I recognize. So what, what other types of opportunities are there in the field? And I feel like both of those can go together nicely. Yeah, well, um, back when I started ALDF, there, there were very few opportunities. The field of animal law in particular and the field of animal protection has really mushroomed um, there are organizations that didn't exist even 15 years ago that now exist that are, that are looking for employees. And it depends upon the kind of work that you want to do. If you wanted to do transactional work, um, the, the, the alt protein uh, firms and, and for-profit groups are, are, are burgeoning. They're just, they're just all over the place and, and, and there are job opportunities there. Um, there are groups, as I started to say, that didn't exist, like Animal Equality, Animal Outlook, Mer well, Mercy for Animals, um, just a variety of groups that did not exist uh, years ago. When, when I first started, it was HSUS, Fund for Animals, um, ALDF, as I started in PETA. And today there are three times as many organizations, but there are other opportunities as well. Um, going into government, uh, going into a governmental kind of job, and, um, and working from the inside out. You know, what about working for the US Department of Agriculture or the Department of Justice if you're in, if, if you're in the United States? Or one of our, one of our um, 2020 uh, graduates is, has now become the chief magistrate of the only wildlife trafficking court in, in Africa. And she's based in Uganda, Gladys. 
um, others, others are magistrates and judges, and so continue their work uh, with this degree, with this, with this, uh, with this understanding that they gain through our through our program. I'm trying to think, what else can people do? There, there. Sometimes people, as, as as Professor Reddy mentioned, bring it back into their law firm. Say, okay, could we expand our practice and be doing some of this? Because there's money to be made now, which which didn't exist years ago. Um, even someone who was doing wills and estates and probate. Um, the, the thing about animal law is, and we joke internally, animal law is all law because animals are used in so many ways and animal law touches on, on contracts and torts and, and environmental law and evidence and constitutional law, uh, wills and trust, SEC. So you can incorporate animal law into really whatever you'd like to do. Great, that was wonderful. Yeah. Dr. Redding, you wanna to add to it? Sure. I, um, you know, some of our graduates have been so creative. You know, we had um, uh, a student come in from Australia Test Vickery, and she'd worked on the VW Dieselgate um, sort of scandal there as it played out in Australia, looking at sort of mass torts um, and class action lawsuits. And she brought that particular um, framework to um, puppy mills. And what does it mean when you sell? Um, a, a dog who has, you know, very significant sort of medical issues so that that dog is quote unquote, you know, not fit for purpose, um, just like um, a, a car that that's that's defective, it doesn't um, uh, meet the the statements on that particular sort of label that's that's given to it. And so um, Tess returned to Australia really trying to negotiate um, doing some of this this animal advocacy work and her law firm work, and you know she became known as sort of the animal law attorney um, in Australia, and now works for the Animal Justice Party. So shifted into into politics, but again, everything that she brings to that position really informed by the classes that she was able to take here, the people she was able to meet here, the connections, and. The one thing that um, I'll add is that we're truly an international program and a multidisciplinary program now, in particular with the um, with the advent of the MSL. And so you're engaging with people who bring all of these different perspectives, um, cultural perspectives, uh, worldviews, and who come and inform um, the discussions that we have in our in our classes based upon you know what they studied either at the uh, bachelor's level, master's level, doctoral level, and the like. And so, I I know I'm speaking for everybody here on this panel when it's when I say it's it's enriching for us. It makes um, the the experience of teaching all that more rewarding. Yeah. I, one of the things that I noticed, you know, because we talk to the students a lot, and one thing I've noticed is that the world opens. Uh, it, it's a new world that opens for a lot of people. Yes, you make connections that you just didn't have access to before, simply because all of us have been in the field for a long time. We know people that we introduce you to. Um, it's just, it's very exciting for students to go through this program. Yeah. Thank you. Th those were both great answers. And I don't have anything to add because you both did a wonderful job covering it. Um, we have an additional um, two questions that came in. Oh, I, I have one follow-up question to what you just said. Um, someone asked a follow-up, which is um, to steer back to the issue of contacts, does the program help online students make those contacts? So the kind of contacts that you've both been talking about. They just come about organically, frankly. When I, I, I run my um, class as paper class and, and I let the students decide what they wanna write about. And I, and I encourage them, write about what you're passionate about. So when a student gives me a topic, I'll say, oh yeah, okay, you should talk too. You know, finish the sentence. Uh, and, and the person they're gonna be talking to um, is often a, an expert in the field, so yeah. Yeah, we introduce them to people because when we see what they're excited about, we want to help them with that excitement and, and to, to, to be the best they can and to learn as much as they can. Thank you. I should also add, we have a, a Slack channel for students in the program and we routinely post job opportunities that come up in the field, academic opportunities that come up that come in the field between all of us at CALS, we, we tend to have our finger on the pulse as to what those opportunities are. And so we are always sharing those with students and with alumni. And um, there are just a lot of synergies that happen as well as Professor Tischler and Dr. Reddy said by all of the relationships and 
community that we build here at the Center for Animal Law Studies. So um, I think we have time for maybe um, another question. And the question is relating to the cost, the annual cost of the online LLM program. And so I'll direct that one to Dr. Reddy. Sure. Um, so this is a good and very important question. And so I want to make sure I get it right. So I'm putting the link to the tuition, tuition and fees into the chat. And so um, if you start in, particularly if you start in the online program, um, you'll see all of the costs there. Um, because the online program is, it's 20, 26 or 27 credits, um, depending on uh, whether you're a US candidate or an international candidate. But um, one of the important things to remember is um, the, the program is 18 months. And so if you start in the fall, you'll continue in the spring. And um, in the spring, tuition increases by approximately 4% each year. So that's another way to sort of factor into um, your analysis um, what, the, what the final cost would be. But to give you sort of a, a general number as, as it is this year, um, it's approximately $51,000, $52,000. And that's obviously prior to any scholarship support then as Dr. Reddy had indicated previously, we do offer scholarships, including full scholarships for the program. Um, so with that, I believe we've um, tackled all the questions. Before we say goodbye, I just wanted to ask you, Dr. Reddy, or you, Professor Tischler, is there anything else you would like to add in terms of concluding remarks? Lewis and Clark uh, has 25 separate animal law classes. Nobody else has that. And I, and I don't mean to downplay other schools, but what we offer is unique in the world. And um, I'm very proud of it. And I'm very excited um, about these, about the LLM and the MSL program. Uh, these, are, these are game changers. We are, we are reaching out to people in parts of the world that we could have only imagined of in the past. And, um, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the people that we showed you, the alumni are doing really important things. Uh, you don't have to sign a contract that you're gonna do really important things, but we find that people, once they have the, the tools that we give them, it just, it, it, it brings them alive in ways that they didn't occur, could, could be brought alive before. And they, they want to do this work and through the contacts, through, the, through the, the classes, through the interactions with other students, as well as us, um, it's an awakening that, that people go through. And it's really, I'd say it's magical, but that may seem a little unlawyerly, but it really is quite magical. <laughs> We like being on the um, Dr. Yeah. Reddy. <laughs> and just, you know, one logistical addition. Um, so right now, um, if you were to apply today, um, the, the in-person application um, is available. Um, you can go to Center for Animal Law Studies.org, go to degrees and um, the in-person degree for the, uh, the in-person option for the degree that you're interested in. The online um, degree application will be opening very soon. So if not later today, um, by tomorrow or, or day after. So please um, stay tuned, um, check our site again, and um, it should be up uh, again very shortly. And I did just put the link um, to our degree programs page to the website in the chat for you. Um, and so with that, I think um, we will conclude our time together on behalf of all of us at the Center for Animal Law Studies. We appreciate you joining us today. If you have any follow-up questions, you can find all of us um, online. Don't hesitate to reach out. And we thank you for your interest in the program. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.